to the Voices from the Vanguard lecture series. Uh, I'm Pat Thomas. I'm the Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism at the Brady College of Journalism and Mass Communications. Tonight marks the third year of this annual lecture series, which brings together people from all over the campus uh, to focus on some of our planet's most important human problems. Tonight, we're going to talk about an amazingly powerful tool for slowing the spread of HIV and AIDS. The other lectures in this series are listed on the back of your program, and we hope you'll show up for those as well. Voices from the Vanguard is organized by Dan Colley, who's down here in the front row, who's a professor of microbiology and the director of the Center for Global and Emerging Tropical Diseases, and by me. And we are extremely grateful for the financial and programmatic support of Dan Center and of the Grady College. And we are also grateful to the Grady College staff uh, who make these things run as smoothly as they do. Although this is a very high-tech presentation tonight because we're talking about movie making. And there is a rule that Murphy always wins and whatever can go wrong will. So uh, that said, we're hoping that Murphy will lose tonight. Um, we are very grateful to all of you for coming to be with us. And after the presentation, there'll be a little reception right next door at Youngstonian Hall, and you get a chance to uh, meet Dr. Winslow and chat among yourselves. As an undergraduate at Oxford University, Dr. Winslow studied French and German. In her doctoral program at the University of London, she specialized in European cultural activist movements. Today, she's on the faculty at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. Over the past decade, she and her husband, filmmaker Daniel Ingram, have engaged more than 100,000 African young people in the battle against AIDS. I asked one of Dr. Winskill's former <coughs> MPH students from Emory, who is now a UGA doctoral candidate in public health, what she had learned from her mentor, Dr. Winskill. And Lynette Golding, who's sitting down here in the second row, said that she learned, and I'm quoting here, it is possible to move mountains of apathy, hopelessness, and stigma by paying more attention to the voice, perspective, and central contributions of those most affected by and infected with HIV. Dr. Winskill taught Lynette to listen uh, and as Lynette put it, there may be a reason we have two ears, but only one now. My mother was a fifth grade teacher in a small southern town for close to 25 years, and she always told me that if she saw a light bulb of understanding uh, illuminate over one kid's head in the course of a school year, then that was a really great school year. Now, Kate Winskill's work, I think, has turned on enough light bulbs in more than 30 African countries to eliminate a night game at Sanford State. So join me in welcoming her now. Thank you very much, Pat, for that wonderful and very, very kind introduction. And thank you to Lynette, who are, there you are, Lynette. <laughs> Lynette and I have a mutual fan club going. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I've got to admit to being a little bit uh, humbled at the prospect of addressing uh, you all in this very prestigious speaker series, um, and especially at the prospect of playing warm-up for one of my heroes, Jim Kim, who's going to be coming here next month. Um, however, I do take great heart in the fact that I am in the remarkably privileged position of being able to share with you some true voices from the vanguard, that is to say the voices of young people um, and others affected by HIV in Africa who are doing everything in their power to contain the epidemic and to improve the lives of those who are most uh, affected and, uh, by the epidemic. Um, the reason I'm able to do this is because this is exactly what Scenarios from Africa is about. It's about allowing those voices to be heard and uh, facilitating that process of social change through allowing voices to be heard. As part of a recent evaluation of Scenarios from Africa, one of our colleagues in Burkina Faso interviewed people living with HIV who are key members of the Scenarios team there. 
One of the recommendations to emerge from that participatory evaluation was that scenarios from Africa should seize on its international profile to attract greater attention, energies, and funding to the needs of people living with HIV and their support organizations. In short, it should place greater emphasis on its mission as a tool for advocacy, particularly on the subject of increasing access to antiretrovirals, including second and third line therapies. So let many thanks then to Pat and to Dan for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak on behalf of this extensive team of colleagues, to advocate on their behalf and to allow their voices to be heard. Thanks too to Anitra Mapp, the, the lady behind the curtain who's going to make magic happen, uh, for helping to make it all happen. I'm very honored to be the guest of Grady College today. As a way of telling you more about Scenarios from Africa and its history, I'd like to share with you a story and a two-minute film. The story is about a young woman, this young woman. Olga Kizwensida Wedraugo. One night when Olga was leaving the office building in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso, where she was working as a summer intern, she heard the security guards who were stationed at the entrance to the compound laughing uproariously. As she approached their guard post, she saw they were watching a tiny television set perched precariously on a shelf. The Dow guards were not known for their sense of humor, and Olga's curiosity was piqued, so she stopped in the shadows to observe. What she saw astounded her, and this is what it was. Hey, what's the matter? No. But you said it would be okay. No. Eh, uh, Kadich. Have you got the things? What things? You promised to get condoms. Eh, uh, I, I, I forgot. Hurry and get them. Hello, Uncle. All right, Adaman. Couldn't be better. Hello there. What's your pleasure? A packet of biscuits. A packet of biscuits. <sighs> damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. I'd like another packet of biscuits, please. All right. I'd better have another one, okay? <laughs> Could I have another packet? Where's he got to? Okay. I'd like a packet of three condoms, please. Give me a couple of those for my fourth wife, please. <laughs> Why am I being so stupid? Please, could I have a full box of condoms, eh? I did it! <laughs> Caddy, where are you going? Eh? Ah, look! Look, I've got them. It's too late. <laughs> Tomorrow, eh? And I'm prepared now. Those of you who read the opening credits attentively will understand that Olga was astounded because the guards, the dower guards, were watching her film. The film started life as an idea that she had thought up for a script writing contest in her final year at school. In fact, it was a pretext not to revise for her final year exams. Olga says that hearing the laughter of the security guards was the greatest reward I could have had. People react to the shop with similar amusement around the world. It's a real universal, it touches a real universal note. The film is available in at least 30 languages, probably considerably more and has been broadcast on at least 100 television channels in almost every country in sub-Saharan Africa and others far beyond, and this was a total surprise to us, in Fiji, Cyprus, Sri Lanka, Haiti, for example. A colleague from Senegal overheard a conversation outside a shop in a poor district of the Madagascan capital, Antananarivo. A young man had just bought biscuits, and his friend was teasing him, saying that he knew he had really been trying to buy condoms. <laughs> they were joking about Olga's film. 
Olga's film, The Shop, was directed by fellow Burkinabe Idrissa Wedraogo, whose latest feature film had been in contention for the Pound d'Or, the big prize at the Cannes Film Festival that year. Olga had the pleasure of acting as his on-set advisor for The Shop. Having grown up in Ouagadougou, the capital of African cinema, she dreamt of becoming a film director herself. In January 2004, her ambition was realized, and she co-directed two scenarios films, allowing the voices of other young Africans to be heard across the continent. Between 1997, while Olga thought up the idea for The Shop, and last November, over 105,000 young people from 37 African countries participated in four scenarios from Africa contests. A fifth contest was launched on World AIDS Day, December the 1st, last year, just a few weeks ago, and we expect, expect tens of thousands more scenarios to flood into the offices of our partner organizations over the coming months. It's an exciting moment. Since the first contest in 1997, an average of three films per year have been produced. The films are not only broadcast on television, they're also used as a discussion tool at community level in multiple African languages, and you're going to see this in a moment. The films are very effective at stimulating dialogue, allowing others to give voice to their problems, concerns, and solutions. As for Olga, well, she has attended international film festivals, sat on juries to select winning scenarios scripts, scripts, featured in scenarios films herself, adapted the films for use on radio, and coordinated a highly successful national scenarios contest in Burkina Faso, encouraging a whole new generation of young Africans to follow her lead. So having outlined the process a little bit through Olga's story, I'd like to go into great detail about some of the, the components of the process and also to share more films with you. There are a couple of themes that will recur, but I'm not, I don't really have time to go into, the, into them in a great deal of depth. The theme of community capacity. I, you'll hear me talk a lot about this as being a process rather than a project because one of our, our goals is to help local communities develop their own capacity to address this epidemic rather than to offer any... Um, pre-made solutions. Obviously, they would, you know, that, that would, could not happen. Another key aspiration is to allow young people and others most affected by the epidemic to catalyze social and cultural change themselves. Now, as I said, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail because I imagine that you'd be much more interested in seeing more films rather than hearing me speak. A couple of pictures. This is uh, Olga with Idrissa Wedraogo. Uh, the, the very famous African director, and her on the set of her own film. Here again, directing her own actors in one of her films. So, it's pretty evident that Scenarios from Africa is a community mobilization, education, and media process involving hundreds of partners, and this is very important. Um, it's, it's always rather embarrassing to be introduced at an event like this because the focus becomes, is on the speaker rather than on the amazing team that is really doing the hard work and making this happen. So I'd like to emphasize again and again the, that, that my husband and I who um, coordinate the process are doing a very small job compared to the local partners. Um, so it's carried out with and for young people. Originally, it was just in three countries in, in Africa. And um, in a couple of conversations today, people have asked me, well, how did, it, how did it grow? And that's the amazing thing. It just grew. You know, it's very difficult to explain how it grew. It, it grew in ways that we never anticipated. The first three films, like The Shop, were originally intended just for those three countries. They were intended for that cultural audience. And before we knew it, they were being shown daily in Lesotho, at the other end of the continent. They'd been dubbed into six languages in Namibia, again, at the other end of the continent. So it really just, it, they, they just grew. Um, so we've been running since 1997 with funding from a range of sources. Our primary funding has come from a wonderful organization called Comic Relief in the UK. We drew inspiration from a, a French project run by a, a wonderful partner of ours named Crips, based in Paris. Um, and, as you know, it involves the production of short films about HIV by leading African directors. But what makes those films so special is the fact, of course, that they're based on ideas by young people. So between 1997 and 2005, there were four contests inviting young people to come up with ideas for these films, implement implemented by over a thousand local organizations. As we've already indicated, a great, fantastic participation that far exceeded all our expectations. And something that was particularly gratifying to us was the fact that around half of all the participants took part in a mixed-gender group. 
In other words, young men, young women, adolescent men and women coming together to talk about issues around HIV, situations on which, in which HIV can be an issue together. And that's very, very important. That's a key element of this entire process is that dialogue that takes place. Um, the contest, we know, has been tremendously ex successful at increasing dialogue and reflection, increasing information seeking by those young people, increasing awareness and use of services. So we have some great data on increases in use of voluntary counseling and testing services, for example, through the course of, of a contest and also beyond. And increasing cognitive rehearsal, allowing young people to imagine themselves in situations that they may someday encounter and through that imagination, through that creative activity, prepare themselves for that situation that they may someday face and develop skills that they're going to need in those situations. Um, also, use their imaginations to, to imagine a different world, different people that they could be. Um, I think that what we, we, when we talk about public health, we tend to think of it as a relatively dry subject matter to some extent. And we exclude some of these creative, imaginative dimensions that are so, so central to our lives, so central to our humanity, to what makes us tick and motivates us. And I think it's very important that this process allows young people to tap into that, that resource, that, that, that depth of humanity. So I wanted to share with you one example of a scenario. What astounded me what, the first year when we saw these scripts coming in was the level of time and energy and care that young people had invested in participating in this contest. And this is just one example of a 21-year-old from the Democratic Republic of Congo. But equally, the ones by nine-year-olds, for example, on little scraps of paper um, are equally touching, as I'm sure you can imagine. These are some winners. Uh, we make a, a big deal of the prize ceremony because it's very important that these young people see themselves as agents of social change and are seen by the communities as such. These are young winners in, on the island of Sal in Cape Verde. And I couldn't resist including this one, although it's not a great photo. This is one great one grower, one grower from Burkina Faso. Um, he is our youngest ever national contest winner, nine years old. So just to give you a sense of how the process has evolved from... 1997 and 2000, when it only took place in three countries, to 2005 and now 2007 and 8, where it, is, it, it, it covers a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. So the winning ideas are selected by a succession of juries, first at a national, then at an international level. And the juries are made up of former contest winners and other young people. This is actually Olga that you can see in the bottom corner. And alongside her is a gentleman called Shekel Masisoko, who is a very well-known African filmmaker, and also until about a month or so ago, he was Minister of Culture of Mali. Um, and he has used his, his ministerial position and authority to do wonderful things for the scenarios process. It's fantastic to have an advocate at such a high level. So people living with HIV sit al and, and other specialists in HIV prevention, treatment, and care sit alongside those young people, as do fantastic filmmakers like Shekel Masisoko and other specialists in communication. And as you can imagine, this whole process, because you're bringing people together from very different domains, is incredibly rich. Everybody has so much to learn from one another, the public health specialists from the communication specialists from the young people. One thing I should mention is that each script is read by at least two people, and it's a very rich dialogue-based selection process. So the films are between 1 and 14 minutes long. An average of three have been produced per year. They cover a range of subjects. And I'd like, just like you, you saw one of the very first films. The Shop was one of the very first films in the Scenarios from Africa process. These are some of the most recent films, really just released in the last few weeks in the run-up to this next contest. This is a fascinating one. It's called Looking for a Brave Man. And it was shot by a female Cameroonian director called Kitty Bebe. Um, what's fascinating about it is that the script was by an 11-year-old from Senegal, and it was about four or five lines long. And it stated simply that it was a young woman who was putting up a poster saying, I'm looking for a very brave man. I'm looking for a man who's willing to get tested for HIV. That's all it took for the juries to talk and debate and dream and discuss for hours and hours and hours on the richness, the potential richness of this little idea. It was just a little nugget that was beautiful, and it's a beautiful film. Another film 
It's called A Love Story. Um, and it's based, by, it's based on an idea by a young man from Cameroon. Jacqueline is on antiretroviral therapy, but she is feeling depressed about her therapy. Uh, she's feeling side effects. She's at a point where she really is, is ready to throw in the towel. She's just having a really, really bad day. Um, she feels like many people who are, have chronic diseases and are taking medication on every day, it's just getting her down, the, the, the constant reminder of this illness that she has. And her husband comes home, and he has to come up with those special arguments to convince her to stay on her therapy. It's a beautiful little film. This next film, The Bottom Line, is based on the overall winner in the last contest, an idea by Fatima Taba, age 21, and her team of 13 young women and one men, man from Senegal. Um, and it's about uh, a boss who is very concerned because he knows that several of his employees live with HIV and that it's time for his company to act, to act in terms of prevention, but also to act in terms of supporting those people who live with the virus. And this was a, oops, sorry. This was a film that I was very tempted to show you, but then um, it's a little too racy to show in a chapel, I decided at the end of the day. <laughs> it's about a young married couple who's been apart for several months. And now they're reunited, and they know there's something that they really need to talk about. You know, have they both been faithful, etc. But they can't quite get around to talking about it. And meanwhile, the volcano of desire is just rumbling away in the background. So it's, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely film. <laughs> but as I say, too racy for a chapel. So the films are donated to broadcasters, and they've been broadcast in almost every country in sub-Saharan Africa, often at prime time. They're available in a range of European and African languages. And I know that UGA has great strengths in African studies and African language. Um, so I've brought a few copies of those different versions for you um, that I hope we can put in the library here. That'd be fantastic. Um, so we now have three different DVD sets, each with eight languages on it. Um, and it's, there's some fantastic work been done across Africa in you know, making sure that each translation is appropriate, making sure that the dub is synced as well as possible, which can you, you can imagine. That's a pretty big challenge when you're dealing with a whole range of different languages. So um, I look forward to sharing those with you. Um, a, a very recent develop, development was a sign language version. So we have a version where um, a young woman in the corner of the screen is signing while the rest of the process goes on. Because as you can imagine, people with disabilities um, are particularly, often particularly vulnerable to HIV. They don't have the same access to information, so it's particularly important to reach out to that population. Um, so as I mentioned, a very important part of the whole distribution process is not simply broadcast. Broadcast is fantastic, and it's a, it's a way of reaching a, a large audience and also a fantastic way of motivating young people to participate in contests. But community-level discussions that can arise following screening of a film in a community are extremely important for this entire process as well. And around 70,000 copies of the films have been distributed in a range of different formats, including a radio, an audio format for, for radio. I just wanted to touch on some of the, the, the range of evaluation activities that we um, conduct, continue to conduct, uh, both internal and also by external evaluators. Um, you know, surveys, data on service provision, various kinds of qualitative um, evaluation, focus group discussions and interviews with participants, mentors, because in, we, one thing we've been doing recently is really building up the mentoring component of the contest. So specialists, especially people living with HIV, are made available to make, make themselves available to the contest participants as they're coming up with thinking up their ideas. So they're a great resource. So young people can sit down and talk to them and say, you know, I've got this idea. Does this make sense? Does this work? And it's a fantastic way for, to deepen their understanding of HIV. The mentors, if they are HIV positive, of course, are under no pressure to reveal their zero status. But we've also found that it, it's a very valuable experience for them too because it helps them uh, maybe prepare themselves to disclose their status to others and just to, to understand where, where people are at in their understanding of the epidemic. We've done ethnographic studies. 
um, obviously formative evaluation and pretesting. The films are, are very extensive, often very extensively adapted and tested to make sure that there's nothing offensive in the script and that the message is optimal. Um, extensive reporting by partner organizations, of course, they're the, the ones best placed to do a lot of the evaluation work because they're seeing the impact on the ground. Um, a, a recent development was exchange visits between different coordinators. So a national coordinator will visit one in another country and exchange experiences. And one thing I did want to stress is um, a kind of research that we're doing right now. We now have an archive of about 40,000 stories around HIV uh, written by young people over now almost 12 years. So as you can imagine, it's an extraordinary source of data on the ways in which young people's representations of HIV have evolved. So we can look, and this is what we're doing right now, we're comparing a very high prevalence country like Swaziland, where 30 plus percent of the population is infected, with a lower prevalence country like Burkina Faso, to see the ways in which the representations of HIV are different in those countries, and what we can learn about how we can target our communication more effectively in those different contexts. A priority of our evaluation, as a priority of all of this project, is to operate in a culture of learning. So we're constantly learning from our experiences and feeding that back into the process. Just wanted to give you an example of the films actually in use. This is our colleague Benjamin Bakwem from Nigeria using the films in classrooms in Nigeria with some pretty nice, quite high-tech technology there, which is nice. Um, and this is some colleagues of an organization called Cinemad in western Burkina Faso who have a mobile cinema unit. They do some fantastic work. Here they're, they're working in a stadium, but uh, e equally well they go into a rural area and string a sheet between two trees and project the movies and facilitate discussion around the films in those kind of contexts. Um, what I'd like to do now is share with you the film that you can just see a little segment of up in this image. It's called Iron Will. We better be going, Jackie. Eh? We'll drop okay. by soon again, okay? Good. We'll be in touch soon, okay? Hey, you take care, okay? No problem. Uh -huh. Okay, see you. Yeah, guys, thanks for coming. Okay. No problem, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to the huh? match, right? Yeah? You don't no change sweat. your mind at no the last sweat. minute. It's okay. Okay, hey, look at that mm -hmm. action. Uh -uh. Listen, shut your mouth or you swallow a fly. Ah! Hey, who's in charge? You or what you've got in your pants? The girl. She smiled at me, and so what? Oh, huh? you've got to get it under control. You saw the state Jack is in? Huh. Only once he had unprotected sex, and he caught the virus. That's right. Listen, but with all these temptations, huh. they're amazing. Oh, yeah, what well? do you do? Listen, my friend, I tell you, there's condoms. They're really effective. Correct. But in my life now, I've chosen another method. Oh? It's really simple. Easy. You can sum it up in three words. Huh? But... You have to be strong, a real man. Ah, and you're sure that it works? Oh, uh, no question. That's what he said. Well, that's great. No problem. Ha -ha. It's proof. <laughs> Hello? Money, sir. I've got a little job for you. Yes? Um, do you think you could make what I've drawn here yeah? in super resistant special steel? <laughs> in special steel? That's right. Those are the measurements. Uh, okay, I'll see what we can do. Okay. Uh, but it's quite costly. Oh, yes. Yeah. How much? Uh, 2,000. That's not a problem. Okay. Hmm. In that case, I'll come back tomorrow. Morning? Yeah. Okay, till tomorrow yeah. morning. Thanks very much. Yeah. But he's got to be mad. In special steel. Good morning. Ah, hello, my friend. All right? Yeah, fine. Ready? Yeah? Yeah. Hi. Uh, do you want to take a look? Yeah, sure. This way. <laughs> I even put in something for those leaks. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> hey, there you are. Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> Good. 
Well, yes, I did my best to satisfy you. Oh, okay? Fine, uh, fine, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, is everything all right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Good. Oh. Yeah. Ah. This is for you. Thanks. Well, thanks. Uh, bye. bye. Very much. <laughs> A good day's work. Good. Ah, the key. Hey, young man, you've forgotten the key. I don't need the key. You can keep it. I'm not going to need it. <laughs> Musa, why are you walking like that? You got a hernia? No, he hasn't. I bet he just walked into a table. No, <laughs> don't Hi, say you that. guys. How are things? Okay. Aziz, eh? thank you very much. Eh? You gave me excellent advice. Eh? You being serious? Your uh. anti-AIDS protection is fantastic, brothers. <laughs> you said protection lies in three words. Yes. The e I on underpants. underpants. Right. Yes. Exactly. Just wait. Look, I on underpants. <laughs> You're crazy. What are you playing at? <laughs> With these, you see, with these, there's no chance of me giving in to temptation. I'll be as good as gold. It's great, huh? Oh, this is unbelievable. It's a figure of speech. My iron underpants are here, not there. <laughs> Look, my friend, to guard against AIDS, you've got to have an iron will, not iron underpants. It happens in your head. <laughs> I can't believe you did this. <laughs> Underpants made of iron. <laughs> That's a bit shocking. Listen, this year isn't the solution. No, no. it's mind over matter. Iron wheel, man. As I, I, I don't think you can imagine uh, an adult sitting in an office somewhere, in an ad agency somewhere thinking up that idea. It just had to come from the, the experience of young people. And it really is a huge hit among, particularly among young men across Africa. Um, we know that this, this term, iron underpants, has entered youth culture in the local dialect in several places. Um, as a way just, you know, the kids saying to each other, okay, you're going out for a night on the town, but don't forget those iron underpants. Or a husband is going to be away for a couple of weeks. Well, don't forget your iron underpants. It, it facilitates that dialogue. It's a way of reframing this whole concept of abstinence or, or even of fidelity and, and making it something that people can actually communicate around. It's less monolithic. And, and just facilitates that communication. So a fantastic idea by Malik Jobyad, aged 19, 18, actually, from Senegal. Um, and one of the things that it does do... Oops. <laughs> sure. Oh, I seem to have uh, moved us forward. Oh. So one of the things that, you know, as you can imagine, if this is shown in a small group, if iron underpants is shown in a small group, it gives you the opportunity to really get people to think about, well, what does it mean to be a real man? You know, what does it mean to have strength of will? Uh, what, is it, what does mind over matter really mean? And what, is, what, what are our, the, the, the current understandings of what masculinity is and how can they be harmful to our health? We really, maybe it's time to rethink those. Those are the kinds of questions that you can address in small groups with doubtless a lot of humor following that film. Um, this is a quote from a, a, a colleague in Mozambique. Um, and she's talking about uh, Caddy, uh, Nancy, who's a very strong woman in one film, and Caddy, who is the young woman who demands condoms in the shop. And she says, Nancy and Caddy inspire our women to contemplate what they want out of relationships. But the men in our group also appreciate these strong women. As one male seminar participant recently noted, I want a woman like that because then I'll know when she says yes, she really means it. So this way of, of really getting people to critically question the um, social norms that they, they are absorbing from their environment and to think about the kind of cultural change that needs to take place if people's health is going to be protected. A couple, couple of other quotes that I wanted to share with you, a couple more voices, if you like. Um, first one from a young commercial sex worker in Burkina Faso. Um, far too often we're considered to be risk groups by practically everybody involved in HIV AIDS. For us, taking part in this contest is a way to tell all of them that we are every bit as, as aware of AIDS as they are 
and just as committed to doing something about it. And we owe it to ourselves to protect ourselves. So again, a very different understanding. You know, it really challenges our stereotypes of, of commercial sex work. And again, a person living with HIV in Burkina Faso. Scenarios from Africa is reaching every corner of the continent, changing attitudes towards those of us who live with the virus. And we're at the heart of it all. And they are. They really are. You can't imagine what that means to us. It makes us feel so useful, so strong. So, um, you, you know, this concept of, of capacity, just, I, I just wanted to touch on, on what this means for the Scenarios from Africa process. Certainly it is about empowering individuals, like the commercial sex workers, like the people living with HIV, but it's also um, about knitting them into the resources within their own community and building up the community-level infrastructure that can allow those community-based organizations to best serve those people. So the, the, through the contest, people get to know the kind of resources that are available to them within their communities. They get to know where the testing centers are, where the resource centers are, who they can talk to about their issues. Um, in addition, it forges links between these different organizations. And as I put it here, um, links small groups into broader networks of influence. So you may be a community-based organization in rural Senegal or rural Kenya, but through this process, you get linked into some of the larger organizations who may be operating in, uh, on a national level in the country. And that's, that's tremendously valuable. Um, it lends new and lesser known organizations visibility and credibility. There's one lovely quote from an organization in, I think, Burkina Faso. Um, the scenarios process gives our organization a kind of aura. Because you have that association with the mass media, it really does increase the credibility of those organizations. It allows young people, as I said, to identify value and use local resources and services. And it empowers young people and organizations by providing them with the, the capital, a symbolic capital within their communities, the respect within their communities that they are having their voices heard. It identifies them as vectors of social change, thereby reinforcing their civic engagement and building collective efficacy. So empowerment and capacity is really about citizenship at the end of the day. It's about letting people recognize that they do have a role in bringing about social change. Um, one of the films is about a young woman whose teacher lives with HIV and whose teacher does not have access to antiretrovirals. And uh, the teacher in her classes in the past has encouraged that young woman to, to take action if there are things that she doesn't like. So this young woman takes the initiative and writes a letter to the president explaining that she isn't satisfied with the fact that her teacher doesn't have access to antiretrovirals. And in the film, the president replies and invites her to come and give a press conference with him. So, uh, and you know, doesn't make a very firm commitment, but indicates that they will continue to work with their international partners and players to try and increase access to antiretrovirals in the country. Um, it's simply an, a, an example of, of active civic participation that young, we need to encourage young people to adopt in this country as well as in Africa, of course. Um, and we know that one girl who watched that film and other scenarios films during the contest was very moved by the situation of AIDS orphans. So she wrote a letter to the president of her republic um, asking that more be done on behalf of orphans and vulnerable children. That, that is, that's exactly the kind of attitude that we want to inspire through this process. I wanted to share with you, before I wrap up, um, some story starters for the 2008 contest, the contest that's running right now. And this will give you an idea of, of some of the ideas. Uh, we do provide in every contest a list of story starters, but young people are not obliged to stick to them. And the vast majority of young people write about the subject of their choice. But these are a few, uh, just to give you an idea. As you know, maybe the, uh, the World Cup will be held in South Africa in 2010, so it's a fantastic opportunity to reach audiences with HIV-related messages. So we, we do have some dialogue going with FIFA right now. Whether or not this will actually come to pass is, you know, remains to be seen. But uh, we invite young people in this contest to write a story for a very short, fast-moving film that could theoretically be shown in halftime during those matches. Um, the second one, I, I talked a little bit about cognitive rehearsal and the power of the imagination. This one is really trying to draw on that, encouraging young people to imagine a different world, imagine that they had magical powers and just by lifting a finger they could change the things in their community and their culture that make people vulnerable to HIV. So tell a story that describes what you would change and what your new world would be like. And then the last one here, your best friend is living with HIV but refuses to get any help or treatment because he is afraid of how people might react if they knew. Stigma, rejection and discrimination or at least your friend's fear of those things could kill him. 
what do you do? So again, imagining young people, putting young people in the position where they imagine what action they will take in that specific situation and how they will respond. Stigma is, is, is a major, major challenge, of course. Um, as I was saying in a class, the undergraduate class today, um, it, so much of HIV communication is not just about prevention. It's about challenging preconceptions about what it means to live with HIV and who is affected by HIV and the stigma that surrounds that. Um, one of the story starters in the 2005 contest invited young people to put their selves in the shoes of a person living with HIV and think about what, was go what, what would go through their heads as they looked in a mirror. It was a real effort to get young people to, to use their powers of empathy to try and break down some of these barriers and some of these stereotypes that um, not only affect the human rights of people living with HIV, but also undermine the prevention efforts for those young people themselves. Because as long as they're thinking of people living with HIV as being very different from themselves, they're not going to get that they're at risk, of course. So um, I'd like to share with you now the little film that came out of that idea. It's based on ideas from young people from across the continent, actually. I think it's nine different countries. And those ideas were framed into a draft, and then um, people living with HIV were asked to comment on that draft and to reframe it. And then the people that you're about to, to see, my heroes that you're about to see, again, determined the, the final shape of the little film. It's called Reasons for a Smile. Happiness is a short thing. The stars are sparkling dots 
We hope in us as long as there is life. As long as there is life. As I looked at a photo of my mother, I remembered something she would always tell me if anything was troubling me when I was little. If you want to see the rainbow, you must first make it through the storm. I had a decision to make. Either stay in a state of total distress or fight. It was all up to me. It was all up to me. So I said to myself as I looked in the mirror, stop sitting around and get down to work. Stop sitting around and get down to work. I found within myself strength I didn't know I had. The will to rebuild everything, to overcome this obstacle. I discovered sources of strength and hope all around me. My family, my kids. <coughs> my friends, my faith. With God, everything is possible. Scientific and medical progress, support organizations for people living with HIV. Why not go back and talk with a friendly counselor at the test center? She said I was always welcome there. I knew that some people would disappoint me, because discrimination does still exist. However, there are always people around that you can count on. You've just got to find them. They're out there. They're out there. Talking about your problems helps to avoid the worst. So, I gathered up my courage and opened up to others. And opened up to others. On the one hand, it did hurt when some people rejected me. But nothing that those people say or do can bring me down. Because of the support that I found among others, their love completely changed my life. My wife. This morning, my five-year-old son climbed up on my knees just to give me a kiss and say hello. Now that is really strong medicine. I'd like to dedicate a trophy to my parents and friends whose generosity and support always helped me in all my pursuits. Now, I have a new mindset. I've re re invented myself. I've refocused my heart and my mind. I accept my status, I live with HIV, and that's that. I may have HIV in my body, but I've removed HIV from my mind. I've freed myself. I've freed myself. I've forgiven. Myself. I've forgiven myself. Her too. Him too. I'm strong. I believe in myself. And nothing can change that. I stand tall in the face of all challenges. I stand tall in the face of all challenges. I never give up. I pursue my dreams with joy, with energy, and with optimism. I'm useful. Lots of people need me. My family and friends, my colleagues, as well as other people living with HIV. They can count on me. And that makes me really strong. I've made my choice to live positively. To live positively. When they told me that my test had come back positive, I felt massive pressure pushing down on me. The other day, I told a friend about that. And he told me with a smile that pressure is what makes diamonds. Pressure is what makes diamonds. My friends and family support and encourage me in everything I do. Never in all my life have I felt so surrounded with love. It's strange, but thanks to my new mindset, I live better than ever. Better than ever. I've even noticed that I live more fully than most HIV negative people I know. My future shines like the sun. My future shines like the sun. And now every second, I live life to the fullest. I live life to the fullest. They live with HIV, and they are my confidant, my friend, our boss, our brother, my wife, my husband, my parents, <laughs> mommy. As I'm sure you understand, that was the perfect film which, with which to close uh, in the voices from the vanguard. Those are the true voices from the vanguard. Um, those are individuals who are, in this case, actors, but who dedicate their lives. Every one of those four individuals dedicate their lives to, com to helping people avoid infection and helping those who are infected to live, with, to live positively and live to the full, as you could see, with their infection. Um, the, the couple in the film, Pianjire and Alanyami, 
uh, from Burkina Faso. They are wonderful musicians, and they travel around the country and around West Africa singing about how to prevent HIV, how to prevent uh, mother-to-child transmission. Their little boy, Fadige, is HIV-free thanks to PMTCT. Um, and so, as you can imagine, they're just a fantastic example, truly, truly inspiring voices from the vanguard. This is one last quote to end with from a colleague in Mozambique. And they apply to, it applies to some of the films you, you've seen and to the film that you just saw. Characters embody our own often hidden struggles and emotions and give an example of how we too may respond. They portray a very real world, an African world, where HIV is raging and heroes are learning to fight back. Thank you. <laughs>